I am then, both visibly and legally, the descendant of slaves in a white western country, a kidnapped pagan who was sold like an animal and treated like one, who was once defined by the American Constitution as three-fifths of a man, and who, according to the Dred Scott decision, had no rights that a white man bound to respect. And this is what it means to be an American Negro. I've written a lot about uh, stand your ground culture and, and stand your ground culture uh, and, and, and of course we came to understand these notions of stand your ground with stand your ground law that allow it allows whiteness to stand its ground against anything that would threaten the privileges that have been uh, unjustly uh, granted to folks who happen to uh, be white Americans, look like, uh, to be white people. And so, uh, and, and, and so white culture stands its ground to protect the myth of Anglo-Saxon superiority, of white superiority, in all ways in which it can do that. And so it stands its ground. So what we see is that any intrusion into the white space, the white space literally, and figuratively, the white space in terms of the privileges of whiteness that come uh, with whiteness, any intrusion into that space, white culture stands its ground to, to create this myth of Anglo-Saxon kind of superiority, white superiority. And so we see it play itself out, of course, uh, literally when with stand your ground law and when it says that well you can stand your ground but we know as the question was raised in relationship to Trayvon Martin who really uh, had more right to stand his ground than the person who uh, followed him uh, Trayvon was 70 feet or so from his home but uh, uh, he was going home the, his killer got out of his car and but Trayvon didn't have a right to stand his ground, his ground. Why did Trayvon not have a right to stand his ground? Because Trayvon was black. Uh, to, and that's a, a right of white privilege. It's no different than someone like uh, Tamir Rice, who in uh, open carry state, Ohio, uh, of course was killed because they said that he had a weapon uh, and apparently was a threat. Well, the interesting thing is, of course, we've seen that he wasn't a threat and that it was a toy gun, uh, but even if it was a real gun and he was in the park uh, playing with his real gun, it's an open carry state. So he had a right to have that gun out and in the open. Ah, but that's a privilege of whiteness. Whiteness stands its ground. Uh, we see the, so we see this kind of thing happen all of the time. So stand your ground culture is a reflection of white supremacy. White supremacy is a part of the DNA of America. And one can, it, beginning with the Puritan and Pilgrims, and one can trace it right through Thomas Jefferson, Benjamin Franklin, the Founding Fathers, and on down the line. And one of the things that we, we recognize in our own history, any time, for instance, there's been black progress, quote unquote, in this country, you've always seen this white culture standing its ground. There's this backlash. You saw it after emancipation and reconstruction, right? We see the backlash that is Jim Crow laws, et cetera, et cetera. The emergence of the Ku Klux Klan and these white uh, hate groups. So we saw it after uh, uh, the civil rights movement. You see Nixon's, this, this language will become familiar, law and order. And you saw this white backlash. And by golly, it should have been no surprise that we have what we have now today because the, up. that's right, the proportional response of uh, stand your ground culture to a black man in the White House is what we have now.
uh, uh, is that's right is make America great again that's mm -hmm. the proportional response to a black man in the White House mm -hmm. and and so once again whiteness is standing its ground now this country has to make a decision and the decision that it has to make and it's the same you know Abraham Lincoln said this during the Civil War right he, he, this country that this country cannot it has to decide whether it's going to be a slave nation or not is it going to be slave or is it going to be free? And we have to decide as a country, are we going to live into the legacy of slavery, which, which is the legacy of, uh, uh, of, of white supremacy, or are we going to live into our democratic rhetoric? which we have yet to do, mm -hmm. uh, live into our democratic rhetoric of being a nation, freedom and justice for all. And he, here we are again, at one of, we are relitigating in so many respects in this country right now. It's not about cultural war, it's not about political ideology, it's about values, it's about our human values, it's about our humanity, which all get, come to the church. Mm -hmm. And so we are relitigating in many respects the Civil War. We have to decide what I what we're going to live into is again is this nation going to carry forth the legacy of slavery or not or if it's going to live into its vision of being a democratic nation this whole notion of make America great again is suggest that we are living once again into a legacy of slavery and of white supremacy because whiteness is standing its ground and one sees that when one begins to look at not only the the campaign that ushered forth from this make America great again ideology but the policies that usher forth from it as well uh, and so in terms of those people who do not fit that narrative. Uh, uh, and so those would be people of color, be the immigrants or people within this country, those would be uh, LGBTQ trans peoples, etc. So the country has to make a decision. But the faith community has to be in the forefront uh, because there's more at stake for the faith community. This is not, you know, we are supposed to be moving uh, partnering with God in mending the world and moving toward this place well, where the... They say, well, it's a broken world, but that's, you know, well, that's not right. But, but when it comes down to the work of, of baptized, quote-unquote, there right. seems to be a lot of dilution, and they seem to compartmentalize. It's not, about, it's not about what we can get for ourselves. It's about changing the world. It's, it's, not, it's not about your success, it's about making the world more just, more reflection of this thing that the beloved community, the kingdom of God is not. And, 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 well, Jesus didn't come change, they could have been king and change no, the world, no, what well, happened to his power? No, you know, it, it, but, but uh, the resurrection said that the crucifying realities don't have the last word. And, and, and as you talk about that, you see uh, sort of privatized notions of religion, uh, Jesus went to the cross, not because he just sort of sort of with these romanticized notions of of love and um you know and uh, pot privatized and pietistic kind of notions of salvation and love. Jesus went to the cross because he stood against a world political, religious, uh, and social powers that were indeed uh, an anathema that were that sinful, mm -hmm. uh, that were against anti-God, that, that were, were betrayed the very meaning of the justice of God. Jesus stood against those powers. Jesus was a threat. And, and that's why he went to the cross. That's what the crucifixion was all about. And so Jesus wasn't crucified because he was a nice guy and, and, he, and, and he was afraid to speak up. He didn't have the moral courage to speak up. Jesus went to the cross because he lit, tried to live into, as, as Mahatma Gandhi would say, he tried to be the change that he knew that we would have. So he tried to be a perfect reflection in his own time of God's kingdom. And so that's what we're called to be. We can't be as perfect at it as Jesus, but we can sure try. Where's that's, Jesus being crucified now? Oh, Jesus, you know, well, we see, we see Jesus being crucified. First of all, talk about it in a couple of ways. Jesus being, well, 
Yeah, let me, and, and I know, and, and it's not that I'm not equating people to Jesus mm -hmm. in, in that regard. But when we look at these movements for freedom, we look at someone like, you know, a, a Colin Kaepernick, hmm? who had the courage, the moral courage, to stand up and say, something's wrong. Now, it seems to me, two levels. One, Colin Kaepernick, when you talk about that, people said, well, he's disrespected America and disrespected the flag. No one has respected the flag more than he in that moment of protest because he says, you know what? What's going on in this country is not a reflection of the country we want to be. It is indeed a betrayal to the flag which symbolizes this democracy that we claim to be. Colin Kaepernick said the, what's going on in terms of uh, police brutality against black bodies is indeed a betrayal of who we have claimed to be as a nation, right? And so now look what has happened to him. That's where you talk about in one sense of the word that this man, whether he says he's doing it or not, doesn't matter, that yeah, this man is ground. carrying the cross, mm -hmm. right? He, he would dare to carry this cross of justice for a better country, for a better world. So, there, so when you see these, the way in which people are literally, you know, not, uh, 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 that, it's not literally crucified, but, 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 but figuratively crucified for standing up for justice. That's, that's what happened to Jesus. The other, other reality of crucifying realities is where, you know, the cross was, as James Cone says, and he's right, was a lynching tree. And so where do we see, it's, it's where do we see Jesus today? And so the question, and so we see Jesus in the faces of those people who are subjected to crucifying realities. Crucifying, the crucifixion is a reflection of the height of human evil the height of human injustice. And so they're, they're a reflection of what I call in our times cultures of death that would relegate people to crucifying realities that cultures of death really are situations in which people are nurtured not to live, but to die. And so, the, where are these crucifying realities? We see these crucifying realities in, in, in where people are engulfed in these cultures of poverty in our inner cities. And so we say to ourselves, and, and so, so we, we see that it is in those people in which we see the face of Jesus that are struggling against cultures of death. And so we ask ourselves, you know, we, we, we talk about things like, uh, the high homicide rates in places like Chicago, in the inner cities of Chicago. Well, what's more amazing is not that we see uh, high homicide rates in these instances, because these people are relegated to live in cultures of death and situations that nurture death. The real miracle is that people live and thrive with dignity. And so those are crucifying realities. And so, so we, we can talk about that and crucifying realities in a couple of ways. And, and, and so we can talk about carrying the cross and that someone like a Colin Kaepernick, Black Lives Matter, uh, they are carrying the cross uh, of Jesus for justice, for a better world. When we talk about crucifying realities, those are realities of death. Uh, those are realities that try to relegate people to indeed die on a cross. And so those are realities like these inner city situations where we have literally school to prison pipelines, where we have people who do uh, not have adequate opportunities for life. Uh, to, and then we wonder why they die. What the cross symbolizes in the black church, many things, but one, one of the things that it symbolizes is that God, through Jesus, has entered, understands black suffering, understands black pain, 
and has entered into complete solidarity with the black struggle for life and justice. And on that cross, God through Jesus let go of any privilege that would separate Jesus from those who are the crucified class of our world and in our society. Jesus and, didn't want to be exceptional? Oh, Jesus was exceptional in, the, in that he was a reflection of, of the perfect love and justice of God. But Jesus was not, uh, and so Jesus emptied himself of anything that would uh, uh, separate him from those who were of the crucified class of his time. Uh, because here's the thing, when we talk about God on the, that we know God through the suffering, through the faces of the oppressed, we know God, God is on the side of the oppressed as they move toward freedom. When we, when we think about that, that we know God best, we see God's most powerful witness from those plates, those crucifying realities where people are struggling for life and dignity and freedom, well, it's because of this. When those who have most been denied justice can then claim justice, then we know that we have justice. It's, it's not when those who have, have, are the dominant class who have enjoyed the privileges of, of unjust privilege. It's not when they talk about justice. No, it's when those who have been denied justice, the, the least of these, when they say, ah, we know justice, then we know justice. And so it's no accident that, that Jesus, God came through Jesus on the side of the crucified class of people of his time and always, always, always moved through. If you wanted to know the love of God, you knew that. You know that through the way in which it is manifest in the most marginalized. When they can say, ah, that's love. We're always called beyond ourselves to move toward freedom.